So, <laughs> welcome to our joint meeting of the Linn County Chapter of UNA USA and Amnesty International Local Group 181. My name is Chris Dalla and I'm the president of the Linn County Chapter of UNA. Today is the anniversary of the passage of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights by the UN General Assembly in 1948, and we celebrate it as International Human Rights Day. We still have a long way to go in the United States to ratify all the human rights conventions that the United Nations has passed. So far, three of 14 have been ratified by the United States. Those are the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, the Convention Against Racial Discrimination, and the Convention Against Torture, Other Cruel, Inhuman, or Degrading Punishment. This is the only country that has not ratified the Child Rights Convention and is one of seven, I believe, that has not ratified CEDAW, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. If anyone is interested in knowing what the other uh, 11 conventions are, I have a list of them here this evening. Um, so Mike Weirich and Alice Dalla are leaders of the local amnesty group, and I would like to invite uh, one or both of them to come and say a few words to us this evening. <laughs> I kind of anticipated that would be the answer. Um, <clears throat> today is International Human Rights Day. It's December 10th, so we look for a change of right on the right day. This is an exciting day for us. It's a solemn day for us. And um, our amnesty, local amnesty group here this year for the first time has participated in amnesty's biggest campaign uh, of the year each year called Right for Rights. Uh, thanks to some of you that came down to the library and wrote some letters already this week. Our local group here decided to focus on four of the 12 cases that were chosen for the global campaign this year. And those four letters are on the back table there. If you weren't able to come down to the library and write a letter, you can certainly sign one that's already rewritten and pre-written back here before we go, you go today. I've also brought three uh, human rights petitions that we'd be glad for you to sign. And we have four urgent action letters that were written by members of our group that they are inviting signatures for. I thought I would just show you there was special artwork for this year's Right for Rights um, <clears throat> campaign. And there's a big poster about it at the back there. This guy is from Saudi Arabia. His name is Walid Abu Al-Qaeda. He is a, one of the most famous uh, human rights lawyers in Saudi Arabia, and he's in prison as a result of that. He is one of our 12 cases and one that our group chose to um, focus on this year. And I wanted to tell you what um, Amnesty International UK is doing on his behalf today because it's International Human Rights Day. He, had a, he sent them a quote that they thought was pretty important. So they made it into a stencil, they took it out on the street, and they graffiti, uh, clean graffiti it. And what, what you do is you put the stencil on the street and then you power wash the stencil and the quote is left on the street. And this is what the street in London says tonight. The oppressor dies and he's forgotten. The free man is jailed and he is mentioned everywhere. So that's what we have from our lead today. So I hope you'll join us and sign some of our petitions and join us some other times and just come to our meetings. Thank you. January speaker is uh, Marty St. Clair. He's a professor of chemistry at Coe College, and he is going to be speaking to us about a recent visit to Jordan and also sustainable uses of water. The January meeting will also be our annual meeting where we elect officers and approve our budget. I would like to remind you all of the red cup on the refreshments table. Donations. Uh, made to the cup are sent to the World Food Program for a school lunch program. Our speaker tonight is Charles Crawley, um, and he is talking on Rafael Lemkin and the Armenian Genocide. Charles is a technical writer at Rockwell Collins and an adjunct professor at Mount Mercy. He became interested in the Armenian Genocide as a result of his friendship with an Armenian who tutored, tutored him in Russia. Please welcome Charles Crawley.
Thank you, Chris. Can you hear me? You, okay, good. And I think Chris is going to dull the lights a little bit so you can see the slideshow better. First of all, I want to thank uh, Jeremy Brigham, who fortunately is here tonight, and Chris Dahl for this opportunity to speak to you and for all of you who have come out tonight for this meeting. My presentation tonight will begin with photos from a trip that my wife Libby Slappy and I made to Armenia in 2013, and I just found out uh, Jan took a trip to Armenia in 2014, so has anyone else been to Armenia besides us and Jan? Okay, three. Uh, I'm going to take that trip and then I'm going to relate it to the life and work of Raphael Limkin. And I will attempt to show that the Armenian genocide was a major influence on Limkin and his life's work. Raphael Limkin is important for Human Rights Day and for the Right for Rights campaign for Amnesty International. As we shall see from my presentation, Limkin believed that the Genocide Convention went further than the Declaration of Human Rights. And Lincoln was a copious letter writer, believing in the power of the written word to change people's minds. In the Jewish commentary on the book of Exodus, it says, A scholar who heeds not the appeal of the oppressed and declines to work for justice on the grounds of being too busy is as one who destroys the earth. I consider myself a scholar activist. I was more of a scholar and less of an activist until I, w I met my wife Libby. But now I am more of an activist thanks to her. I have good role models in the community as well. Here I am thinking of Al Fisher who has inspired me and continues to inspire me by the way he can bring books and knowledge into the service of truth and justice in social and political affairs. Reinhold Niebuhr would be proud of him. Raphael Wimkin stands in that line of scholar activists who, like Martin Luther King, could have chosen to stay in the ivory tower of academe rather than getting involved in the great issues of his time. My interest in Wimkin has to start with Armenia, for without Armenia, neither Limkin nor I would have taken the road that leads to genocide studies, awareness, and activism. In 2006, I was invited to visit a friend in St. Petersburg, Russia. And in preparation for the trip, I contacted the Russian language department at the University of Iowa to find a Russian tutor. They put me in touch with Arshat Verdanian an Armenian who was studying for his English as a second language master's degree at UI. As Armenia was part of the Soviet Union for 60 years, Ashat was fluent in Russian and an excellent teacher as well. But in the process of learning some Russian, I also learned about Ashat's homeland, Armenia. I'd like to just kind of walk through some of these slides now. Uh, just so you know where Armenia is, it's right here. It's uh, surrounded on four sides. To the north, you have uh, Georgia. To the west, you have Turkey. To the south is Iraq. And to, the, uh, to its east is Azerbaijan. And the sad thing about it is that two of those borders are closed. The, the border with Turkey is closed and the border with Azerbaijan. So uh, Armenia has to deal with, with Georgia and uh, Iraq is the two, I'm sorry, Iran, not Iraq. Iran is the two countries uh, that, that they can have commerce through and the other, the other places are, are closed and you can get through them but it's very difficult. Uh, Armenia is an ancient kingdom. Uh, it's mentioned in the Bible and we'll see a picture a little bit of Mount Ararat. Of course, that's the place where the legendary biblical, uh, the Noah's Ark landed. And you'll see why people thought that when you see the mountain. Um, anyway, uh, Armenia was the first country uh, in, in the world to adopt Christianity as its religion. 
in about uh, 300. So it was, it, was, it was the first to do that. We stayed uh, not with the Schatz family, but we stayed in a motel, the Marriott Inn, in uh, Republic Square in Yerevan, the capital of Armenia, a wonderful town. Every night, Libby and I, from our window, would see how many? How many? Uh, 82, 82 uh, streams of water, Fountain. fountains that would jet in different colors to music that they played. And people would sit around there. It was like being in a Fellini movie, really. And, uh, and so, you know, that went on until about 11 o'clock, and then it would shut down, and everybody would go home. Uh, the countryside of Armenia is very mountainous, and uh, it's, it's tough traveling. Uh, you, you really have to have some way to get around in it. Hiking is, it would be very tough, but we uh, had the benefit of a, a chauffeur in a car. Uh, a shot would uh, hire someone to, to take us different days and uh, had these wonderful little valleys there where they would have restaurants and things for you to go visit. Okay, Mount Ararat. I could not get enough of Mount Ararat. Jan's shaking her head here, so she understands. Uh, in fact, when we, when we flew away from Mount Ararat, I, I craned my neck as far as I could out of the plane just to look at it. But it just, it, you have a, a flat, uh, horizon here and it just erupts out of it. And this is a smaller sister peak, uh, Sis and Assis is what they call them, but uh, it's, it's amazing and, and what happened when Libby and I got there uh, it, was, it was cloudy and we couldn't see this and finally I saw something up there in the, uh, up at the top of a cloud and I thought wow that looks like a mountain. They said yeah it's Mount Ararat, you know just poking above the clouds but uh, it took us a long time to see the whole thing, but it's, it's, it's indeed a wonderful thing. And of course, when you see how prominent it is, you realize why people thought that that's where the, the ark landed, because it's just huge. Whoops. And it's what? 18,000 feet. 18, feet. Okay, thank you. Um, and the best shot we got of Mount Ararat was when we were leaving in the airport. And this has kind of a strange tint to it. And the reason it's colored like that was we were shooting through the window of the airport, but all the clouds left, <laughs> and there it was. And we were like, wow, look at that. And this is in August, and it's still got that much snow on it. And uh, it's, a, it's a holy mountain to the Armenians, and it's sad because uh, Lenin, uh, in one of the treaties, uh, gave it to Turkey. So uh, when, when the Armenians look out at uh, this, this mountain, which used to be theirs, uh, they have to remember every time that it belongs to Turkey. It's not theirs. Okay, the people of Armenia. Uh, while we were there, Ashat, and he's right here in the corner. This is his, his 90 year old mother. And this is his brother. And these were members of his family and friends who gathered for his birthday in a restaurant. And uh, Armenians believe in the tradition of toasting. I, I don't know if they got that from Russia or <laughs> they had their own tradition of toasting. But anyway, they make a lot of toast. Well, I thought I would make one. And so I stood up and uh, I said that I was going to remember the Armenian genocide. And they all stood up. And it just amazed me because you could tell that the feeling was so strong that they just, they just immediately re responded to that. Uh, a shot took us to the Genocide Memorial, which is uh, the top picture, a uh, very impressive building. And then uh, next to it, kind of uh, underneath of it, is the Genocide Museum. It's hard to see it here in the picture, but uh, you'll see the, the, the numbers 1915, that's when the uh, genocide began. It's carved into that. And as we were leaving, a shot just happened to mention, he said, well, you know, Charles, uh, and this is, you know, he, he has since moved to, uh, to Canada. They tried to get citizenship here, but they couldn't, so they moved to Canada. But he said, you know, Charles, uh, Iowa is, is one of a few states in the United States that hasn't recognized the Armenian Genocide. So I didn't know that, but I took that kind of as a, as a challenge and to, to learn more about it and to see what I could do to advocate for it. I just want to give you a few facts about the Armenian Genocide. 
and uh, began April 24, 1915 with rounding up of a group of intellectuals and it continued on through 1921. Uh, basically the genocide involved deportation marches. Some of them were done in railroad cars, cars like in World War II with Jews, but mainly they would force them out onto the road, out of their homes, and march them uh, through the mountains. You saw the kind of terrain that they would have to go through, and uh, eventually uh, they, they were supposed to arrive in, uh, in Syria, in a place called Der Zor, which is the equivalent of, of uh, Auschwitz for Armenians, and of course most of them died from hunger, disease, uh, being shot, uh, and so on this march it was really a farce. Uh, they, they weren't intended to survive once they were forced out of their homes. Um, more than a million and a half people were murdered by the Turkish government or people under its direction, and that, that uh, fact will be dis disputed by Turks and uh, some other people. But it's, it's kind of akin to what's happening with climate change right now. It, it's, a, it's an increasingly smaller number of group, group of people that have, have just have to deny the facts of, of the history. Uh, the Turks have never officially acknowledged it. They will not use the term Armenian genocide. That does not exist. They'll say massacre or some other word, but genocide is a word they will not use. Um, and they have not made any compensation to the people of Armenia for the for the land that they took, uh, their houses, and money and other property. And as I mentioned, I was one of seven U.S. states that has not yet recognized the Armenian Genocide, and the, <coughs> pardon me, the U.S. has not done so either. <coughs> okay, <clears throat> this is where Raphael Lincoln comes in. Lincoln was born into a Jewish family in Poland in 1900. His father was a farmer and his mother was an educated woman who made sure that her son got the best education he could. He attended classes where he learned about the prophets in the Hebrew Bible. In his autobiography, <coughs> pardon me, autobiography which is entitled Totally Unofficial, Lincoln says, the lives and deeds of poor men who challenged kings and priests to obey the religion of the heart kindled fire in the heart of a small village boy studying the Bible. Another major influence on Lincoln was the pogroms that the Jews was, were suffering from in that part of Poland, which were a prelude to the persecution that they endured in World War II. John Cooper, in his book entitled Raphael Lincoln and the Struggle for the Genocide Convention claims that these pogroms against his own people had more influence on him than the Armenian Genocide in his early student days. But even so, the Armenian Genocide never left Lincoln's side in all his years of arguing for the Genocide Convention. Lincoln studied law at Lvov University in Poland, and while he was there, the case of Sagamon Tellerian was in the news. Tellerian was an Armenian whose parents had been killed in the Armenian Genocide, and Tellerian was enlisted in a plot to kill the Turkish perpetrators of genocide. His target was Talat, which is the man on the right. The main perpetrator of the genocide, who was living in Berlin, where he was given refuge after his government collapsed. Now you have to remember that the Turks fought on the side of the Germans in World War I. Some people don't realize that or have forgotten it. So anyway, that's why they were giving him refuge. In 1921, Tellerian did get his revenge. He assassinated Talat in Berlin, and in the sensational trial that followed, Tellerian was acquitted on grounds of insanity. The jury only came to this verdict after Tellerian's testimony, which included graphic descriptions of the Armenian Genocide. It was a case where personal justice was pitted against social justice, and in this case, social justice prevailed. Limkin had a heated exchange with one of his law professors at Lvov about this case. It's quoted in Cooper's book, quote, Limkin asked, why a man 
who had participated in so much killing had not been arrested. To which the professor responded that there was no law under which he could be charged. The professor says, let us take the case of a man who owns some chickens. He kills them. Why not? It is not your business. If you interfere, it is trespass. Lemkin brushed aside this analogy and persisted with his argument. And he was met with the objection that this would interfere unduly with national sovereignty. Lemkin responded that sovereignty of states implies such things as conducting an independent foreign and internal policy, building of schools, construction of roads, in brief, all types of activity directed towards the welfare of people. Sovereignty cannot be conceived as the right to kill millions of innocent people. I'm going to be talking about Lincoln as a refugee. This is a picture that I took, uh, I found on the internet of Syrian refugees, and I took it because it's just a good picture of, of kind of the sadness. They're not dead. They're sleeping on each other, uh, you know, it, probably in the early morning. Who knows when they're sleeping? But it just kind of shows the desperation of refugees. Another event that had an even deeper effect on Lemkin with regard to the Armenian genocide, and that was his own personal experience as a refugee who had to flee his homeland. In his autobiography, which was published posthumously in 2013, he describes his flight from Poland in 1939 and 1940 through his travels and travails in Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, Sweden, and then finally he took a long intercontinental trans, uh, uh, trans, uh, transcontinental railroad trip across Russia where he embarked for the United States on the far uh, eastern side of Russia. In excruciating detail, Lincoln describes the challenges, deprivations, and near misses that comprise his time as a refugee. If you look at his autobiography, his refugee makes up four of 12 chapters. That's one third of the book. And though his uh, autobiography was incomplete, I think you can tell by what he wrote what was important to him. Lemkin's autobiogra autobiography is highly reminiscent of Grigoris Balakian's book, Armenian Golgotha, a memoir of the Armenian genocide. That memoir describes Balakian's journey through Turkey in one of the deportation marches that the Armenians were forced to undergo in their relocation to the Syrian desert of Derzor, which as I mentioned before is, is the Armenian equivalent of Auschwitz. If you only read one book on the Armenian genocide, that is the one I would recommend. The life of a refugee leaves an indelible mark on you for the rest of your life, one that cannot be expunged no matter how good your life is in another country. And I think Muru, the Burmese refugee, made that clear in last month's UN meeting. In totally unofficial, Lemkin writes that, quote, there were three things I wanted to avoid in my life. To wear eyeglasses, to lose my hair, and to become a refugee. Now all three things had come to me in implacable succession. <laughs> Once in the United States, Lemkin spent some time as a professor at Duke University Law School. In 1944, Lemkin published his most famous book entitled Axis Rule and Occupied Europe, where in chapter 9 he coined the term genocide. He writes, new conceptions require new terms. By genocide we mean the description of a nation or an ethnic group. This new word, coined by the author to, de to denote an old practice in its modern development, is made from the ancient Greek word genos, which means race or tribe, and the Latin sede, or killing, thus corresponding in its formulation to such words as tyrannicide, homicide, infanticide, etc. In his first development of the Genocide Convention, Lincoln was trying to do several things. First, he was trying to broaden the understanding of mass killings to include the concept of culture. To destroy 
a culture would end up destroying a people. When the Turks started the Armenian Genocide, they started by rounding up the Armenian intellectuals and killing them first. That disabled the Armenians from developing an opposition that could have stopped the genocide. In developing a concept of cultural genocide, Lemkin was broadening it from merely physical genocide. He writes that the main point was for mankind to appreciate the cultural contributions of minorities and small, small nations to world civilization and the loss that would ensue if they were slaughtered like chickens. The Genocide Convention was also developed to help minorities or smaller nations. Majorities and big nations can protect themselves with arms. Minorities and smaller nations needed the protection of international law. Again, Lemkin resorted to the metaphor of chickens, and I think that went back to his argument with the uh, with his professor at, at, in Poland, you know, the, the chicken metaphor comes up again. Lemkin writes, the main thing is to make the nations of the world feel that minorities and weaker nations are not chickens in the hands of a farmer to be slaughtered, but they are groups of people of great value to themselves and to the world civilization. I can't imagine what the world would be like without the contributions of Jews like Freud, Einstein, Mahler, Buber, Marx, Mendelssohn, Copeland, Bernstein. Lemkin lobbied intensively for years on the passage of the Genocide Convention, giving up teaching positions. He truly believed he escaped from the Holocaust so he could work on this cause. It cost him dearly in terms of money, relationships, and health. But on December 29, 1948, the General Assembly of the UN voted unanimously in its favor. This was Lincoln's finest hour. And this is, I just put this up here, it's Article 2 from the Genocide Convention, sort of what I would consider the heart of it. Uh, I'll let you read that for yourselves. The fight for the Genocide Convention was not over. It would take 20 member states to ratify it so that it could become part of international law. Again, Lemkin worked hard to find countries that would ratify it. It was interesting that many of the Latin American countries were Lemkin's allies in this endeavor because they realized how vulnerable they were to bigger countries, having suffered so much in their histories to larger nations. The Genocide Convention reached its goal of 20 ratifications by October 16, 1950, but the United States was not one of those countries. By 1959, there had been 59 ratifications, second only to the number obtained for the UN Charter itself. As Cooper writes in his book on Lincoln, many of these ratifications had been obtained by the hard grind of Raphael Lincoln himself through copious letter writing, Amnesty International, take note, you've got a good forebear here, and the incessant lobbying of delegates in the United Nations. Shamefully, the United States had still not ratified the Genocide Convention and would not do so until 1988, 29 years after Lincoln's death, and only after Senator William Proxmire of Wisconsin had given 3,211 speeches about it on the Senate floor. <laughs> For the years that Lincoln had tried to get the U.S. Senate to ratify the convention, he had to battle a coterie of southern U.S. senators or Dixiecrats who thought that the Genocide Convention would be used by American blacks against them. And the Southern Democrats, as well as some others, thought that the convention could be used by the Soviet Union. This was going on in the background of the McCarthyism. There was one African American, William Patterson, who was affiliated with the Communist Party and who did level the charge of genocide upon blacks by the United States. Lincoln did not support this man or his claim. He himself was a believer in gradualism. Lemkin was nominated for the Nobel Peace, Tri Peace Prize six times in the 1950s. He died in poverty in a shabby New York apartment in 1959. He was buried in Mount Hermon Cemetery in Queens, New York with the inscription, Dr. Raphael Lemkin, 
1900 to 1959, the father of the genocide convention. And there's some Hebrew writing above it. And I asked Rabbi Todd Thalbum of Temple Judah to translate it for me. And he says it means Raphael bar Yusuf Halevi, which means Raphael the son of Joseph the Levite. I would like to conclude with an example of his letter writing ability, which as I mentioned earlier, demonstrates his belief in the power of the written word. In the summer of 1950, he wrote to Thelma Stevens of the Methodist Women's Council, quote, This convention is a matter of our conscience and is a test of our personal relationship to evil. I know it is very hot in July and August for work and planning, but without trying to become sentimental or trying to use colorful speech, let us not forget that the heat of this month is less unbearable to us than the murderous heat of the ovens of Auschwitz and Dachau, and more lenient than the murderous heat in the desert of Aleppo, which burned to death bodies of hundreds of thousands of Christian Armenian victims of genocide in 1915. Blessed be the memory of Raphael Lemkin, and may, be, may we be empowered by his spirit to fight the social injustices of our day. Thank you. Yes, Alice. A couple of questions. <clears throat> One is, do you know how many countries now have signed on to the genocide uh, convention? And secondly, like, why has Iowa recognized the genocide? Okay, I've got to get my notes here. Excuse me. Because <laughs> <laughs> I anticipated such a question. Um, in terms of, their, well, there are 27 countries that have recognized the Armenian genocide. They include such countries as France, Germany, Greece, uh, Sweden, Russia, Poland, Netherlands, uh, uh, several uh, Latin American countries. Um, and what I have been told by people who have been you know, working on this, Armenians, is that when these countries said that they were going to recognize the genocide, that the Turks would say, oh, you know, it's over. You know, we're not going to have a relationship with you. And then, after a while, they went back and things were fine. So it didn't really have the punishment that they thought it would have. Uh, your second question is, why has Iowa not? Um, there, there have been attempts um, several years ago. Uh, there was an Armenian student who, who very valiantly tried to, uh, to lobby for it uh, unsuccessfully. Uh, I think. Its success in other states depends on largely Armenian populations, and we have very small Armenian population in Iowa. I don't know what it is, but it's it's small, uh, so that's part of it. But you know, just last year, states like North Dakota, South Dakota, Vermont, you know, they they have uh, you know have have recognized it. So uh, it's possible to, to happen here, and I suppose it's it's like anything; it has to have a group of people lobbying for it. So, does that help? Yeah, how long ago did somebody try? I think that was 2006, maybe. Ooh, so, yeah. Yes, we, Lee? We had a, a wave of Armenian refugees come to America. Mm -hmm. Yes, we did. And what years was that? Well, it would have been in the 20s. Um, and there was, there was a lot of what they call uh, ancient Near East support. Uh, churches raised money. That's where the phrase you, you've heard of starving Armenians. That's when that developed. Uh, and, uh, and Iowa actually was part of that uh, a group of people who raised money for Armenians. Yeah, I have a teacher at Marion High School was an Armenian. Hmm. And Liz taught with him. But I, I didn't hear his story about hmm. it. Hmm. Yeah. And uh, go ahead, Lee. The other question I had was, uh, I read recently in a book by Robert Fisk that uh, the Turks got the uh, Kurds to kill the Armenians. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know what you now that's aware of that. Yeah, uh, the deportation marches, they, they were involved in that. Uh, Jeremy, you want to yeah, add to that? I've been reading the same thing that uh, Louisa read. Um, but I think, you know, you showed the map of Armenia, and that's the current. Mm -hmm. But the Armenians, when they were deported, 
live intermixed with the Kurds yes. in southeastern Turkey. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was an area of the, the headwaters of the Euphrates and Tigris that Turkey wanted to claim mm -hmm. and buy the others out. And the Kurds remain there, yeah. which is still a problem for Turkey. Yes, and, and sometimes you wish, boy, if the Kurds and the Armenians had, had gotten together, maybe they could have, but, you know, politics, the, the Kurds got with the Turks and um, had a bad ending for the Armenians. My teaching of Middle Eastern geography, mm -hmm. there was always a question of like, where were the Armenians? You know, they're not in where it was now Armenia. Yeah. They were driven out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But they were, as I said, mixed in with the Kurds. Yeah. No, no, there was no country. Just, well, the, the let's go back to that picture, if I can, if I can get back a, to it. You know, Whoops. Was the Republic of the Soviet Union. Sorry, yeah. Um, yeah, it, it actually went up, and they, they had a coastal area up there, and that was actually crucial for them, because now they're landlocked. And the sad thing for us when we were there is that we could see not only the effects of 60 years of being underneath the Soviet Union, and that had ultimately disastrous effects on them. Uh, a shot told us that for many years, uh, well, I, I shouldn't say many, you know, two years, they were completely without electricity uh, when, when Russia, uh, you know, collapsed. Uh, they had to, you know, heat things. They were, they were seen by candlelight. He said they went back 100 years uh, when that happened. But... Uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that part of the poverty that Armenia has now is the result of the genocide. That, they, that their land was taken from them, their wealth was taken from them. And there are groups that have calculated, I can't remember how much money it is, but it's billions of dollars that, that, that they were cheated out of. And so they were impoverished as, as a nation and you know, have had to work really hard to, you know, and that's why Armenians are still trying to leave the co country. And that group of Picture, in that picture we showed you with all the people sitting at the table, there were a couple there who had just won the lottery <laughs> to come to the United States. And, you know, they were so excited about it. But it's interesting that, you know, they're, they're still leaving because it's such a hard environment there, you know. In, yes, uh, Jeremy. Jerusalem, several years ago, many years ago, and I was very surprised in the old city of Jerusalem, there are four quarters. It's Christian, it's Muslim, it's Jewish, and it's Armenian. Hmm. So it's a wow. connection. And there was a sign in a window honoring the uh, 75th anniversary of the Armenian hmm. genocide at that time. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, hmm. Why are they here? It's sort of because I think they're sort of the original Christian group, mm -hmm. the early, very early mm -hmm. Orthodox Christian group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and their their Christianity is very much their own. It's not it's not part of Roman Catholicism. It's not part of Orthodoxy. It's their own Armenian Church. The yes, Jim. Church does recognize recognize it because you can't go to a Roman Catholic Church. You're there, they're, they're not a Roman Catholic Church in Europe. Hmm. Yeah. 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 I didn't know that. And so you can go to their service, and it's recognized. Oh yeah, yeah. We went there. Etch me Osman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, Robin. Uh, just a footnote, and then a, a question. Uh, the Presbyterian Church has had a close has had close ties with the Armenian Church over the years, and uh, many Armenians, when they come to the United States, gravitate. To the Presbyterian Church, hmm. don't know why, don't know details, but <laughs> it may be maybe missionaries. Uh, well, I think there there have been those kinds of conversations. Yeah, uh, and there, uh, I don't know how, whether there's an Armenian church in the United States or not. But uh, at any rate, the the question that I had of you, uh, you seem to have taken a lot of interest in this issue, and I wonder uh, what would be involved and what would be the consequences of, uh, uh, say, you know, a group like this or uh, mustering a petition to uh, go to the Iowa legislature and request that uh, Iowa recognize the Armenian genocide 
and and uh, further to say that uh, in recognition of this genocide, we believe Turkey should pay reparations. Yes. Well, thank you for asking that. Uh, we're actually working with some people on that, and you'll be hearing more about it. So, more to come. Yes. I'm curious why the borders with Turkey and Azerbaijan are Well, I think it's another way to try to put Armenia down. Azerbaijan is essentially a, a well, I don't know, Turkic state mm -hmm. on the other side. And, and so um, there is a country in between them that is in dispute, a very small territory that's in dispute between the two. And they actually fought a war. When we went to the genocide memorial, you know, I showed you that picture, they started to have a memorial to the Azerbaijan war, and they had buried about six of their soldiers up there, and they had these really interesting grave, gravestones for them, but they decided to stop. You know, they didn't know how, how big was this going to get, so they quit. But, you know, they, so they, they do have this really volatile relationship with Azerbaijan, and Turkey is just, you know, the, the, there's just that... I don't know that there's a, an animosity between the two that's it goes way deep, and it's it's not to say that there aren't Turks now who are speaking out. Uh, Orhan Pamuk is anybody familiar with that writer? He has spoken out about the Armenian genocide, and people still read. Wait just a minute, Jeremy. The gentleman behind you had a question. Sorry. Uh, this is an aside or an impertinence, but. Uh in 2002, I think it was, I precariously rode my, rode my bicycle out to the uh, Crown Plaza on Collins Road for a great big shindig with the uh, creme de la creme of Cedar Rapids for a big birthday party for my friend John Donnelly, who happened to be 99. Mm -hmm. And he had a very good friend named Crawley, and Charles Crawley, in fact. I just wondered, is that your father? No. No, I, I'm, I'm from Texas. This is the only place I've ever seen Crawley's outside of Texas. Well, in Iowa. No okay. Uh, I wrote an essay for our after group one time, not too long ago, about inventing new words. And mm -hmm. Lemkin invented the word genocide. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, in the world we are faced with, we need maybe some new words like he found, mm -hmm. especially for people whose lives are shattered, families and children, mm -hmm. uh, on the one hand, or on the other hand, you know, we're obsessed with terrorists. But these are human beings, and they somehow became that way. Mm -hmm. And maybe a word that describes the transition from a normal life to this. The philosopher, the late philosopher Ronald Dworkin, said we have the responsibility to live a good life. And uh, I think if we could find a word that could be used worldwide when these things happen, mm -hmm. lives are being torn apart and mm -hmm. destroyed. Uh, the process, maybe we could get a grip on it. Mm -hmm. That's not a question. Well, that's a good comment. Uh, just this past week, the Christian Century had a really nice article. I don't know, maybe you've read it, uh, Al, but it's about how the term Judeo-Christian is outdated now, and the and the term that's being used is Abrahamic, because that includes the Muslims. And so, uh, what you hear among certain politicians is they'll talk about the Judeo-Christian. And it's their way of cutting out the Muslims. But, you know, we should probably be insistent about using Abrahamic as a word. But that's, I think that's akin to what you're saying. We do yes. have some words that partially fill that need because they internally displace people. Mm -hmm. Or you can say something like marginalized people. Um, there, there are some Instead of refugees or? He's talking about people the, who are, have lost everything or are oh, losing their okay. place in society or their place in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there are words that we can use if we think about it. depends on the group and why they're in such a position, but mm -hmm. um, there are some words like that. Mm -hmm. Chairman? Yeah, I was going to go back to the uh, relation between Armenia and Turkey. Mm -hmm. uh, early on, in, a, a couple of decades ago, Turkey tried to open up relationships with Armenia, but Armenia would not do it until Turkey acknowledged the genocide. Mm -hmm. And so uh, mm -hmm. the, the border remained closed because mm -hmm. I mean they don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're they're pretty insistent about it. Yeah. And 
that I think the area is Nagorno Karabakh. Yes, that's it. Thank you. There's a dispute. Yes. Like there's an exclave of Armenia and an exclave of <laughs> Azerbaijan. Yeah. And they want to, tr you know, some people want to trade back and forth with their, you know, with their ethnic groups that maintain their ties. It's kind of like Cyprus. Yeah. Well, yeah. 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 Or Russia has an exclave on the on the Baltic Ocean also. Hmm. There are a lot of Russians there that other people. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. When we were there, there was a bad Westbrook, people ran Westbrook when we were there. We went to the border. We were not allowed, and they were building berms all along the border. And there was With Iran? Uh-huh. Mm. The day we left, Azerbaijan shot down by the Armenian helicopters. Mm. And so there was a little skirmish, and mm -hmm. 17 were killed on both sides. Yeah. Mm. There's a lot of but there are ethnic groups in that part of Iran too. They have Kurds, they have Azerbaijanis, and they are oppressed minorities in Iran. Mm -hmm. So they don't want those people any more than the countries uh, on the other side mm -hmm. of the border. What's the total population? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know. Charles, uh, yes, with Robert. the way things have shifted over the years, with the Kurds being close to the Turks in, uh, in the early part of the 20th century, uh, things seem to have changed quite a bit in that regard. Uh, and I wonder, uh, what's the relationship of the Kurds to the Armenians now? You know, I don't know that. Um, I, I know that, you know, the Kurds are are fighting with the Turks now, and there, there's a, they call them the, some kind of Kurdish terrorist organization, but... PKK. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's, it's, you know, they would like to carve out a chunk of Turkey for themselves, and of course Turkey doesn't want that. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, right. Yeah. There was, yeah. for a short time, right. Kurdistan, yeah. yes. uh, which included part of Turkey, part of Syria, part of Iraq, part of Iran. Mm -hmm. uh, but the British didn't want to give up their part of Iraq to the Kurds. Uh, the Syria, French didn't want to give up their part of Syria to the Kurds. The Turks wanted the headwaters of the Tigris and Euphrates, and Iran you know, wasn't going to give up its part either. So uh, despite Wilson's idea of the plebiscite, mm -hmm. Uh, the, the powers that need and want that to happen. Mm -hmm. the, Kurdistan is the, lar the Kurds are the largest ethnic group in the world without a country of their own. Mm -hmm. They're also Muslim, and the mm -hmm. uh, Armenians are Christian. Yeah. So there's another division. Yeah. Charles, the population of Armenia in 2015 is 3,010,600. Yeah. That's like Iowa. Yeah. Six thousand states. What has the UN tried to do to debate and publicize and perhaps make pronouncements about the genocide, particularly now that Samantha Power, uh, a <laughs> wonderful scholar yeah. about genocide, including the Armenian genocide is our ambassador. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Sorry, I don't know the answer to that. If there are no more questions, uh, Let's have another round of applause for you. Thank you.